nonlinear regression. We'll start by defining the problem, and that's a little bit different than linear regression. Then we need a little bit of background on multi-parameter Taylor series. We don't need to go too crazy with this, but we will present that. And that will lead into the formulation of nonlinear regression. And we will finish this by discussing the algorithm. So we have some function f, and this is a nonlinear function. It could be sines, cosines, exponentials, Gaussians, logarithms, or anything like that. Really, it can be anything. And we have a similar setup to our linear regression. We have a bunch of measurements, and we want to fit that to this nonlinear function. But we have a problem. We can't put a linear function into a matrix equation in order to do the fitting. So we're stuck here. What do we do? So here's our notation. We have some function, and it's a function of x. And we have a bunch of curve fit parameters here. And these might be you know, your frequency for the cosine or a width of a Gaussian, or who knows what these could be. But these are the coefficients for your curve fit. And then we have our measured values of f we're calling y here. The multi-parameter Taylor series, the reason we need this is this is the key of how we're going to go from our nonlinear functions to something that is linear that we can put into matrix form. So let's just remember the standard Taylor series for a single parameter. We have some value of x that we're calculating our Taylor series about. So we have the function at that value. We have its derivative times a change in x. It's second derivative over two factorial times the change in x squared plus the third derivative over three factorial times the change in x cubed and so on. So that's the single parameter Taylor series. And I'm just sort of dumping this here. I'm not deriving this, but here's a Taylor series for two parameters. And this, this first set of terms is kind of what we would expect from the single parameter. We have our function. And then we have the derivative of our function, but it's going to occur twice, once for each of these two variables that we have. And then we have a sort of change in x and a change in y here. Well, we have our second derivative terms, and we also have a cross term that arises here, and it gets even more complicated as we go higher and higher. But it turns out we're going to drop all of the higher order terms, and that's because we're formulating an iterative algorithm that will iteratively improve the curve fit. So we don't necessarily need an exact Taylor series here. So we will proceed with the n parameter Taylor series written as what we're showing below. And here's our n parameters that we're writing, x1, x2, all the way up to xn. Our original function plus a summation of, and each one of the terms in here is our function differentiated with respect to each one of these independent variables times the change in that independent variable. And what we're, this, the way we're defining this change is our measured value minus this value that we're calculating the Taylor series about. So let's go on. Hopefully this will make more sense when we apply it. Formulation. So we're going to write our function at all of our measured data points. And so we have M number of these. So here's our function. And we also have the residual terms because we know that this isn't exact due to noise in our fit. And so rather than keep writing all of this stuff each time, here's our, our closed sort of shorthand notation for doing this. So y1 equals f of x1 plus the residual one. Now here's the real crux of the problem. This function is a nonlinear function. And so we can't put this into matrix form. So the next step is we're going to expand that with our Taylor series. So when we do that, when we expand our function into an n parameter Taylor series, this is what we get. Remember, we've dropped all the higher order terms. Well, what I'm circling here is our Taylor series. We still have our residual term we're adding on. So we still have our measured value of y1. And here we have delta a naught. This is our a naught minus whatever a naught we've evaluated our Taylor series around. And a similar one for a1 and so forth. And when we develop our iterative algorithm, eventually we're going to interpret these. We'll solve for these deltas, and that'll tell us by how much to change our curve fit parameters for the next iteration.
but this is something that is linear and can be put into matrix form. So that's what we do here. On the left side of the equal signs, we have all of our measured values of y, so those go into a column vector. We then have our function values evaluated at our measured values of x, that goes into a column vector. We have all our residual terms that collect into a column vector. We have a bunch of crazy stuff multiplying our delta a naught, delta a1, delta a n, and we put our delta a's into a column vector. And all these other partial derivatives, they collect into this big matrix that we will call Z. And this is going to cause us a lot of work because on paper, we're going to have to derive all of these partial derivatives with respect to all the different variables that we're doing a curve fit to. So if our function contains, let's say four, in this case, three, we're showing three, uh, we're gonna have to calculate three partial derivatives. And then every iteration, we're evaluating those partial derivatives at each of our measured data points. But anyway, we've reduced our equations to this matrix equation. We took our nonlinear function, expanded it to a Taylor series, that let us jump to linear equations that we put in matrix form. So the whole point of this, we are formulating an iterative algorithm that will improve our curve fit parameters each iteration. And so we want to solve for this delta A from our previous matrix equation because that's going to tell us how much to change those curve fit parameters each iteration. So we grab the equation we had on the previous slide and let's cross off the residual terms. We're developing an iterative algorithm that will successively improve its guesses each iteration. So we don't need the residual terms there. We'll bring this F over to the left-hand side. And now look at what we have. We have Y minus F. Y is our measured values, f is our fit values. So this really is the current error of our fit. So let's just call that d. So we have d equals z a. d is a column vector, delta a is a column vector, and this is that big ugly rectangular matrix that has a lot more rows in it than it has columns. And so we can't solve that exactly. We have to do a best fit. Let's solve this by least squares. And we know that that has two parts to it. First part is pre-multiply both sides by the transpose of this big rectangular matrix. So we're pre-multiplying both sides by Z transpose. And then the second part is solve for that delta A. And we also know don't simplify this further or we will lose any kind of sense of our least square. So that's the key equation for calculating how much we have to improve our curve fit coefficients each iteration. So just to remind something that we, we keep saying, this delta A is not our curve fit parameters. That is how much to change the curve fit parameters, hopefully to improve the quality of the curve fit. So we do need some initial guess, and we'll talk more about that, but we need an initial guess, and we'll start the algorithm with that, then every time we calculate a delta A, we simply add this delta A to our current values and we get a new set of coefficients that we then go into our next iteration with. Given all that, let's pull this together and talk about the algorithm. So our algorithm begins with step zero. I am calling this step zero because this doesn't happen in computer code. This happens on paper. So you'll sit down with pencil and paper and you're gonna derive a bunch of derivatives and then program those into your code. So if your curve has three parameters that you're trying to find, you have three partial derivatives that you have to calculate. So we're differentiating our function with respect to each one of the parameters in the curve fit. Now we can enter the code. The first thing the code needs to do is make a very good guess at those curve fit parameters. We're calling them A. This is a touchy algorithm. It can fail, it can not converge. And the better our initial guess is, the better chance we have of this converging. So definitely invest some time to figure out how to do that. Then once we have an initial guess at our curve fit parameters, we will evaluate the function using those curve fit parameters at our measured values of X. So we have our fit values. Given the fit values, we can calculate this error term D. That's our measured values minus 
the fit values. At this point, we need to construct this big matrix Z. And so we will evaluate these partial derivatives at all of our measured values. We will populate the Z matrix. And when we step through the example, this will make more sense, but this is a lot of work. It's a lot of work on paper up front, and it's the most work in the code. But we populate this big Z matrix, and then we use least squares to solve for delta A. So it's really just this one equation. Once that's derived, that's pretty simple in the code. That delta A tells us how much we need to adjust our curve for parameters by so that we have a better curve fit in the next iteration. So the delta A is really just how much we're changing our curve fit parameters, which we're storing in the column vector A. So the curve fit parameters for the next iteration, iteration I plus one, is the curve fit parameters from the previous iteration I plus this update delta A. I'll mention as sort of an aside that nonlinear regression can be a touchy method. It can be it can suffer from convergence issues. It can even oscillate and be unstable. So I might even say it should be standard practice to introduce some sort of convergence rate parameter alpha here. And a value of one reduces this to the, the standard nonlinear regression algorithm. When it's unstable, very often you can mitigate this by choosing a smaller value of alpha than one. I tend to first try values within the range 0.1 to 0.5. For whatever reason, 0.1 always seems to be the first thing I try. Um, of course, that'll converge a little bit slower than a value of 0.5, but it's also possible that 0.5 won't converge. But that's where I tend to start. I'll experiment with that a little bit. We also need to know if we're converged. And so what I like to do is look at the difference between all of my curve fit parameters and I'll normalize those to the curve fit parameters. So that way I get sort of percent error. I'll look at the biggest one and make sure that that is still above some kind of tolerance when I, to keep iterating. Once that falls below my tolerance, then the changes are small enough and the algorithm can end. Here's a block diagram of the same algorithm that I think helps visualize things. So the very first thing up front, we're deriving analytical expressions for the partial derivatives. The very first thing the code does is try to make an intelligent guess given all the measurements. It then enters the main loop and it evaluates the function at all of the measured values of X. And it's using those first curve fit parameters. Given those fit values, we calculate the error term. What's the difference between our measured values and our fit values? That's D. Given that, we build the big Z matrix. Then we can calculate our delta A by solving that system of equations by least squares. We update our curve fit parameters. And then based on how much we're changing delta A, we look at what the maximum change is. And when that falls below a certain threshold, we'll check that and we might be done. If we're not done, we use those new A parameters, evaluate the function, calculate the error, build the Z matrix and, and do this whole cycle all over again. However, if our delta A does fall below a certain threshold, in other words, we're not changing our curve fit parameters that much anymore and we've converged, then we would say that we're done. Here are some final notes that I want to make about nonlinear regression. So this method can be used to fit any set of measured data to any function. The only real requirement is that the function has its first derivative that exists. We have to be able to evaluate the first derivative. The way I've shown here, we've done this on paper, but it's actually also possible to do this numerically. But regardless, that first derivative has to exist. The method is touchy. It doesn't always converge. And I found the better you can make that initial guess, the better chance you have of this algorithm converging and finding the correct answer. So use the most intelligent guess possible. Spend some time thinking about how that could be done. I'll also mention that linear regression is a special case of nonlinear regression. We can still fit straight lines using nonlinear regression. That's a bit like swatting flies with a sledgehammer, but it's absolutely possible.
From the bottom of my heart, thank you very much for watching this video. I love hearing your stories about how these videos helped you. I also love answering your questions. So please tell me your stories and ask your questions in the comment section. I promise I will try to answer every single question that's asked. If you like this video, hit the like and subscribe button. I also recommend visiting the official course website that has links to the latest versions of the notes, the latest videos, and there's lots of other resources to help you learn, including implementations in MATLAB. I'll see you in the next video.